Welcome to the selling show where we unpack, repack, and break down exactly how top experts sell their ideas, their value, and their services. This is your host, David Newman, and you are in the right place if you want better clients, bigger deals, and higher fees. You now have permission to sell. That's right. I've got Mr. Permission to Sell.com, Jeremy Demerchant. Welcome to the selling show. Thanks, Dave. I appreciate it. So I am so excited to be talking to you again. Give us a little bit of an idea of the permission to sell empire. Uh, what are the services? What is it that you sell? Who do you sell it to? How does all of that work? Give us the big picture. Sure. So big picture is, um, I just like to help businesses grow, which can be a strength and also a weakness because I, I like to help everybody, but that's not a good business model. So ultimately, we focus on helping people grow, build and grow their sales teams. And the at the low end, typically someone that's got three reps and a sales manager is a great place to start. And we can go um, to teams of hundreds. Um, and ultimately, our goal is to help them double their sales in 12 months or less. And tell us how you do that. Is it consulting, mentoring, group programs, one-on-one? Give us kind of the menu of different ways people can work with you. Sure. So at a high level, um, I I love doing the consulting side of things and helping guide people through it. But even more so, I find that if I've got my hands in there and essentially act as a sort of a, a virtual sales director and work directly with the managers and even do some coaching on the with the reps, get in there and it's kind of a you know, high touch experience. And that helps people get the fastest traction from what I've found. But for people that have smaller businesses just getting started, a lot of people just need a little bit of guidance along the way. So I do have some group programs for that as well. Things are a little bit more designed for businesses that are just getting themselves up and running. And so whether it's your year one or you're in year 30, we can help. Awesome. And you're also, and we'll talk about this more later, you're also the host of a fantastic podcast called Sales Team Rescue. That's right. Just wanted to put that right up front. So if the podcast listeners can add that immediately to their subscription list on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts, Love it. Sales Team Rescue is Jeremy's awesome and amazing show. And I was on there early on, early yeah. on. It's time One for of another the first handful of guests. Yes. <laughs> Hoping for a repeat appearance, by the way, hint, hint, nudge, nudge, we'll but that we've, we've talked about that. Okay. <laughs> so let's roll up our sleeves. Let's get down and dirty. And we're talking about some real life sales situations, kind of behind the scenes, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Like many of our sales experts and sales mentors, you have a unique perspective on this because obviously you could share one of your stories or you could share kind of a common pattern that you see among your clients that you work with. but. Here is the first behind the scenes question. Can you think of an opportunity that you thought you totally lost? Somehow that sale went off the rails. You totally blew it, but you didn't. Somehow that sale got saved or the prospect didn't feel a disconnect the way that you felt the disconnect. That client ended up buying anyway. So think of either a sales fumble that you recovered or something that wasn't perceived by the prospect as a fumble at all? Is there a sales that you won that was especially surprising for you? So there's a situation with a client where I was actually doing a sale for them. And I messed up in presenting the offer so much that the only way I could figure out how to not get ourselves in a bind was to come back and say, you know what, I'm not, I'm, I don't think you're the right fit. And I thought that was going to be it. And this lady came back, and it was only a couple days later. Jeremy, please let me know how on earth I've managed to get fired as a client before I even became a client. I really want the service. And what it allowed me to do, and this wasn't, a, you know, it wasn't the normal takeaway strategy. This just was, I needed to get out of the sale because I had set the wrong expectation. And when we got back in the conversation, I said, look, we can make it happen, but it's going to have to be under these conditions, not the original ones that were discussed. And it allowed me to, to shift it and 
she became a client. But I had never seen anybody want to become a client as bad as she did, which you know helps me understand why the normal you know take it away from them strategy works so well, which I don't normally do. So I thought I'd ruined it on purpose. Yeah, um, how about that? Well, came begging back. I want to dig into that a little bit, and if yeah. you can remember a little bit of the details around this, when you said I messed up the offer so badly. Was that you were overpromising? Was there some kind of sales desperation? I better make this sound better than it is. I better load in all the bonuses, all the extras, all the things that we don't really do, but <laughs> this lady wants to hear them. So it yeah. might have been that, it might have been something else. <laughs> Where do you feel that that offer part of the conversation went so badly awry? I misunderstood something. So it was totally on me. And so I, ultimately would have ended up overpromising in error. And I don't remember exactly what it was, but I remember that it was so bad that I'm like, we need to not have this sale because if the sale goes through as it is, I'm in trouble. And I think it was, I think it probably had something to do with the guarantee I had given that I misunderstood or left out a very important caveat of the guarantee or, or something that wasn't easily just, you know, explained away an hour later. Right. Yeah. So I wasn't trying to be overzealous, but there was an ignorance piece that played into this mistake. And so yeah. now I make sure my last client that I onboarded, my first conversation with him was three and a half hours, making sure I understood his product. So, wow. Very nice. Yeah. <laughs> so this is the part where in my world, we say, you know, this particular program, it has a 100% money back guarantee. I just leave out the part that you get it back in monopoly money. Right. <laughs> like you don't get actual U.S. or Canadian currency. You get monopoly money is the <laughs> refund. Oh, David, you didn't mention that in the sales call. No, of course not. So, you know, stuff like this in our, our world. Right. I do want to go back to what you said about the whole scarcity takeaway, sure. because people hate that. I know prospects all hate it. And a lot of salespeople are now coming to hate it too. There's a big unless, I think, unless or until. Unless or until it's 100% true. It's 100% genuine and it's 100% authentic. Right. So yours was 100% authentic. Like, get me out of here. I don't yeah. want this sale. It might not have been for the actual reason right. that yeah. you said, well, you're not a fit. Like she was a perfect fit. You just blew that sale so badly. You were pushing her away kindly saying, hey, let's not do this. Let's not pull the trigger. Mm -hmm. I'm good. That is hugely powerful, but only if and until it's real. In your own world and the way that you advise your clients, how do you encourage them to have that level of vulnerability and authenticity and how to bake? Because I, I know that you're one of the good guys out there for sure. That's one of the nice things that people ever say about me is, David, you're one of the good guys in the industry. You're not like 99% of the shysters and the goofballs. So Jeremy is totally one of the good guys in this industry. Appreciate it. How do you teach and train and reinforce that vulnerable authenticity and say, listen, your life, your business, your revenue, your sales will be a lot better with this than without, even if you lose a sale now and again. How do you reinforce that for them? Well, so the nice thing is when I work with, I work with a lot of clients that have service-based businesses. And so first of all, if you bring somebody in under the wrong pretext, life's going to be hell. And so I would much rather have somebody join for the right reasons or not join for the right reasons than join for the wrong reasons. Mm. Okay. It doesn't matter. And there's been times in my life, in my career, in my business where I made a sale that I probably shouldn't have. And I can think of three of them off the top of my head. And they were all 30,000 plus sales because I'm a good sales guy, but I enrolled the wrong kind of person under the wrong circumstances just to make a buck. And they canceled the month later. And so it made me, I was really stressed out for that month because it wasn't the right circumstances and it came back to bite. Now, luckily I've still got good relationships with those people, but you just got to be clear on what matters most. And one thing, and it's interesting, people bash the network marketing space and I don't play in that space typically, but there's some great sales lessons. And one of the best things I ever heard was some will, some won't. So what? If this person says no, they're not the last person in the world. Right. Right. Let them say no for the right reasons and go on and find someone that you really want to work with or will be an ideal client and will become the cheerleader that you need and send referrals. Yes, yes, yes. And amen. 
I mean, one of the reasons that your clients come to you, one of the reasons our listeners should check out everything that we're talking about and your world and permission to sell and the sales team rescue podcast is putting yourself in a position where you never have to do that again, specifically around having a pipeline. So many salespeople, so many sales managers, so many entrepreneurs, so many experts and consultants, when they get a prospect, that is the prospect. Oh, Jeremy, this one has to close. This one is my paycheck for this month. This one is the deal. This is the big whale I've been looking for. And you are so committed to making that sale, whether it's a fit or not, whether it's profitable or not, whether that should really be your client or not. If you have 20 other people lined up behind this prospect, you would be in a beautiful position never to have to trust a prospect because you can trust your process. Mm. So talk a little bit about the prospecting and lead generating process that you help your clients with so that when something lands in their lap, it's never, oh my God, this is the only sale I'm possibly going to make this month. Right. Well, so I have a different approach than a lot of people do, and I don't consider myself a lead generation specialist. I am all about networking. Like you and I met through networking. And I just help people build those ongoing relationships. So somebody once told me that sales is a contact sport. The more contacts you make, the more you win. And so ultimately, you need to be out having those conversations and building those relationships. But from a strategic perspective, you just always want to make sure you're never banking on one client. So I got into business and it was because I was tired of letting one company determine my paycheck and my livelihood. And ultimately, if you've got one dream prospect that's going to be the whale that you close, you're still doing that. Even if they do close, you're banking your entire livelihood on one person or one business. And the, the process that I really like is Chet Holmes' Dream 100 process, where just choose who you want to work with, like real names, real people, real companies, write them down. And uh, it's in his book, uh, The Ultimate Selling Machine, Ultimate Sales Machine. Ultimate Sales Machine, I think. Yes. And he walks you through it. So it's not my idea. I just love it. And you just make this list and treat them like people. How do we get them to move to the next step in the process? Which maybe nowadays it's a sales video or a webinar where back in his day, it was come to my presentation about advertising in a newspaper. But it was whatever it took to get them there. And that's when you can explore some processes like you know, lumpy mail. There's a story I heard. I don't know where it came from. It's not my story, but someone who talked about the same idea, there was a, someone who wanted to meet with an executive and the executive was tied up, wouldn't meet with the person. And then the guy did a bunch of research on him and found out he really liked these new running shoes that were about to come out. So he bought them and sent him one and said, you get the other one when you take my meeting. Okay. You can't do that when you're trying to manage a thousand leads. Oh. But you can do it if you have a real list of 100, no, a real list, not, oh uh, yeah, I'll call them sometime next year, but a real list with real identity so you can actually get to know who they are. Because whether it's business to business or business to consumer, it's all human to human. Yes. Amen. Holy smoke. So much value in this episode. Listen, if you are loving what you're hearing, feel free to download, subscribe, tell a friend, leave a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening to The Selling Show. Now, back to the interview. Now, I know that one of the things that you help your clients with, and this is so great. I'm, I'm going to take a little bit of a detour here because I know this is one of your areas of expertise for sure. CRM, mm -hmm. right? CRM using fantastic market leading tools like Pipedrive, some of the other ones that are out there. I love Pipedrive. I know you're a big Pipedrive guy as well. It is super easy to get started and it can get very sophisticated, very helpful, very detailed. I'm a super simple guy. So I basically use it like, oh, look, post-it notes. Here's all the yeah. people who want to give me money. Yeah. And, uh, but then you can really drill in and make it very, very useful. You have your dream 100. Yep. Tell me about macro level. How do I set up my CRM? How do I even think about my CRM? Do I love my CRM? Is it very labor intensive to keep it up to date? How do I keep 100 balls in the air? How do I even keep 20 balls in the air if I'm doing it on a week by week? you know, bases, you know, four times 25, that's a hundred touches a month, et cetera. Talk to me about CRM. Give me the CRM talk. Sure. So 
I'm also very simple. And for me, simple means the less work I need to do, the better, because transparently, I can get kind of lazy. So if I have a system that can do most of what I need to do, I'm going to leverage that. So for example, I like a CRM that will automatically bring your email conversations in so you don't have to take extra notes. I love CRMs that can automatically record your sales calls so they're there. So if you forget what you talked about, you click the button. Or if you're using Zoom, you can paste the link for the recording in, but have it all there. The other piece as far as follow-up and strategy there is just think these people are human. And whether it's Pipedrive, um, I actually have a, have a new CRM love, to be honest. It's called SalesMate. And they don't pay as good of a commission as the other guys, but I'll tell you, I like them better because they do more. And what I really like is they've got these automations that you can trigger based on activities. I mean, a lot of other ones do as well. But if you think about what type of experience or touch does somebody need at any given point in the sales process? So for example, I'm with one of my clients right now and somebody reaches out, you know, and I get a little inquiry in the system. I can manually send them a text. I can manually email them and try to get them booked on my calendar. Or I can have an automation that says when somebody inquires, send them an email right away with a booking link. And if they don't respond or book, send them a text the next day with the same booking. And just keep it as hands-off as possible. Because the salespeople, my experience anyway, we like to have the conversations. We like to solve problems. But most of us don't love the administrative side of it. It's a big task for me just to put notes in after a sales conversation. I do it. But it's a big task. And so I want to make it as simple as possible. And so as far as follow-up goes, just think about what a real human might need, assuming the best case scenario at all times. And what I mean by that is we have a tendency to assume when somebody doesn't respond to a text or an email or a phone call that they want us to go away. And that's not the case. It's 2022. We're busy. And every single person watching or listening to this has at some point gotten a voicemail on their phone from somebody that they've wanted to get back to and forgot to. And they didn't hate them. So if we keep that in mind and think, okay, somebody has express interest, or we've identified them as an ideal client that we can help. Our job as the sales professional is to do everything in our power to show them the opportunity that we have. They don't have to buy. A no is okay. But if we don't give them the opportunity, we're robbing them of the ability to potentially change their life. And so from a frequency perspective, how often is too often to mess with somebody? Well, if I was to send you a text every day, it might bug you, but eventually you're going to respond to me, right? Now, I don't recommend every day, but I do know you're more likely to respond to a text than an email, right? Or right before the show, I messaged you on Facebook Messenger because it's a place where socially we're comfortable engaging more quickly than an email. So there's no real rule, but if it's somebody you haven't gotten a hold of yet, three attempts a week is like the minimum. And it could be an email followed by a text. I mean, I'll typically do like six. I'll do an email followed by a text if I'm not, not getting responses and do that three times oh, with phone calls too. So you, if you're not sure if you're overdoing it, then you probably should do more. Yeah, there's a great rule of thumb for sure. And I love what you're saying, Jeremy, about kind of multi-touch, multi-method. Would you agree? And I've, I've heard, I forget who said this, but it makes perfect common sense. You send some emails, you send Facebook Messenger, you text you do one or two other things, you leave a voicemail. Do you subscribe to the concept that the channel in which they respond is the channel they probably prefer? Like if I send three emails and I don't hear from you, but I send a text and then you respond right away and the response is not, stop emailing me, right? But say, like, hey, you know, David, yeah, blah, 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 right? Am I gonna assume that I should stop emailing this person because they respond via text? I should probably take the conversation to text. As a rule of thumb, I would say if the conversation is active, yes, let's move it to text where they're playing, right? Play where they're playing. But if it starts to go stale again, keep mixing it up. Yeah. Omnipresent is the word they use, right? Right. Uh, you know, be everywhere. Okay. And that makes that's ultimately sense. ultimately the goal for sales and marketing. Be yeah. Everywhere. Well, let me ask you another kind of behind the scenes down and dirty, because you mentioned, you know, CRM, it's going textbook, you have the whole end to end. Mm -hmm. This is a question about a sale that was going textbook. It was the dream sale. They're responsive, they're excited, they're leaning forward, buying signals left and right. 
somehow you hear that record scratching across the needle kind of sound, mm-hmm. they don't end up buying. They don't end up buying. This is literally a defeat pulled from the jaws of victory story. If we were talking about medicine, the analogy is the operation was a huge success, but the patient died. Do you have a story and some advice around those situations that we all really don't like, but we can probably learn a lot from? Well, so the nice thing about sales is that the patient never actually ever dies. They're always there. You might have lost that opportunity in that moment, but that doesn't mean you're done forever. So that's the nice thing about sales. But you know what? To pick one oppor- one situation is really tough because it happens so often if I'm going to be totally transparent. There are sales processes that seem so textbook. We're all the way through to the end. We're ready to go. Yeah, let's do it. And as soon as there's a situation where the person on the other end of the phone or the Zoom call or whatever has to do something on their own. So for example, I have one client and the, the sales process is signing a lot of documents in DocuSign. And it's not something that I would typically walk somebody through step-by-step step because I've already discussed it, but they need to go and do the signing. I have had situations where it would save people $30,000 or more if they get the paperwork signed within a specific amount of time. And they still don't do it. Why? Well, because things come up, questions come up. And in certain situations, I hadn't built enough trust for them to come back and say, Jeremy, hold on, I still have this question that wasn't quite answered. And so my first recommendation is don't stop just because they stopped. In fact, if the last engagement felt like it was a commitment on their end, go to the point of harassing them until they tell you, never mind, I changed my mind. Because you don't know what's going on. They could have lost the link. They could have forgotten about something. You know, there could have been an emergency in their life and you just got backburnered. And that's okay. But don't give up on them. Okay. And, and mostly in sales, when in the analogy, the operation was a success, but the patient didn't make it. The patient doesn't make it in sales because we give up on them, not because they're actually a no. And like I said, it happens all the time. I'm super guilty of it. But if you, one, focus on the relationship, make it okay for them to say no. Don't do high pressure stuff, especially if you're talking big ticket. Two, if they ghost you, well, one, we're going to talk in in a little bit about how we can avoid the ghosting part too, actually. But if they ghost you, keep going. Don't stop until they tell you to stop because you're going to let somebody down somewhere and nobody likes to let people down. And ultimately when you do, like that's just giving up on them. So don't. Do what feels uncomfortable. Keep the contacts going because that's how you're going to make a difference for someone. Wow. Really, really profound. In fact, is that not the tagline of permission to sell? When people go to permission to sell.com, get uncomfortable, get results. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Really, really profound. I love that concept that the sale isn't over until the salesperson gives up. Yes, I know. Terrific episode here, but Have you seen our latest web training? Oh my goodness, pop over there right now or as soon as you're done listening to this episode, it's doitmarketing.com slash webinar. See you over there. Back to the good stuff. So I definitely want to hear about how to avoid getting ghosted in the first place. We'll put a push pin on that. We'll come back to it in a minute. So let's say that we're either in a prospecting mode or we're in a follow-up mode for a sale that didn't happen yet. Mm-hmm. Notice my new language, I love not it. a sale that didn't happen, just mm-hmm. a sale that didn't happen yet. Exactly. What is your follow-up cadence? What is your recommendation to stay in front of people? Because I know a lot of sales professionals, and I say it all the time, you say it all the time, we got to build relationships and people leave it there. And then folks listening to us right now going, Jeremy, I want to build relationships. I want to sell human to human. I get it. I love everything you're saying. How do I build relationships? What does that actually mean on a daily, weekly, tactical level? So what's your keep in touch strategy that stays in front of prospects without becoming a pest or without it becoming weird? Well, so I would say, let it become weird. I mean, become a pest because you want them to not forget you, right? I would much rather have a solid no now than have it drift off for the next two years, but it still might. So To directly answer your question, my follow-up cadence, there's what I recommend and what I really do. So I'll be transparent here. I'm super bad at managing time. So I'll tell you about the cheat codes, but this is sort of where the avoid getting ghosted thing comes in. But for me, 
I just make it a point. If I have a lead that I really think can, I can help and they haven't gotten back to me, then there's a difference. If they haven't gotten back to me versus they're saying, not yet. If they haven't gotten back to me, they're getting something from me every single week forever until they tell me to stop. Is that your regular email newsletter? Uh, no, so this... if It's this is all custom. This is like, I mean, there might be some templates that I'll use. And if I was smart, I would build out an automation that didn't stop until they responded. It would be the smart way to do it. But something that's, you know, nudging them to at least respond. If, if they've gone radio silent, we want to at least get a reaction. In that scenario, your messaging can be a little bit more aggressive or a little bit more creative. There was something I picked up from a lady. Oh, what's her name? Her last name's Robottom. I forget her first name. Anyway. She had posted on LinkedIn this image that she sends to people when they stop responding. And it's a meme of a skeleton sitting in a chair saying, I'll just wait for his call or I'll just wait for the call or whatever. And it's a joke, but it'll get people to respond a lot of the time. So you want to get creative with that. If somebody has said, not right now, I'll ask them, great, when can I check in with you? And whenever they say, and they'll typically say three months, six months, I'm going to mark it for one month. Because as much as they think life isn't going to change in the next 30 days, it will. And I want to be there when it does. It might be a quick phone call, might be just a voicemail. Hey, David, I wanted to reach back out. I know we chatted about a month ago and you were talking about XYZ. I um, would love to hear how that went and see how your New Year's going. You know, something like that. And I want to keep it warm. If I can find an excuse to message somebody with content that'll help them, like you hear this all the time, find a news article and send it to them if it reminds you of them. That's really hard to scale. But if you can do it, like if you've got, you know, six figure clients, go find some news articles that remind you of them and stack them up. Hey, this is the file for David. You know, like I saw you shared yesterday, a year ago or two years ago when your book came out, I had took a picture of it in my local bookstore. Yes. Right. That could have been an excuse for me to reach out to you if we were in the middle of a sales process at that time. Right? Yeah. And then just the reminder of it is another excuse to reach out. Hey, remember that time I saw your book? It's awesome. You know? So there's many things we can use, especially with social media. Find their favorite sports teams, whatever, and talk about whatever you can to build that relationship. So make sure if they ghost you, something happens every week. If they say, not until, reach out to them every month just to check in. Because even wow. if it's a year out, it doesn't matter. You want to be there. And the reason why, and you can even frame this to them, and you can say, look, I appreciate it. I understand things are going to change for the next three months. But look, I'm going to reach out to you in about a month. And the reason is because I've found that people in your situation have changed all the time. And if there happens to be something going on that I can help you with, you know, if it's a problem you can solve or just some advice that I can give, I want to be able to do that even if we're not talking about a sale. Is that all right? Oh, totally. That'd be amazing. Thank you. And they welcome it. Right. Well, so that's what happens if we get ghosted. What is the secret sauce to not getting ghosted in the first place? <laughs> So this is, in, in all fairness to your audience, this is like probably my number one requested presentation, but I'm going to make it quick because obviously we have some time constraints. Um, I'm lazy, like I mentioned. Or maybe I'll call it efficient. Let's go with that. That sounds better. better. I'm efficient, which means I'm not great at chasing people or I don't enjoy chasing people. And so I've got three rules to avoid getting ghosted. One is never send information. People are like, oh, send me the information. I want to look at it. Never. I want them on the phone or on a video call with me going through it because what happens when they get information, especially if it's a contract or something, they go right to the price and then they shut it off. They just make assumptions. So I want to be able to walk them through the process so they see the value before they see a price. Or if there's information that's there, if there's anything that we didn't talk about or they forgot that we talked about, I need to be there when they have a moment of making a decision. It's like why people have the chat bots on their website right on the order page, because people are making a decision. The credit card is not working. They need help. Be there. We need to be the same way when it comes to the information. Whenever at all possible, avoid sending information. I had one gentleman who asked for a, a proposal. And it was a big proposal. I said, sure, I'll send it over, and then we'll go over it next Wednesday. He got on the call on that Wednesday and said, I never got the proposal. And I said, okay, send. And then I sent it to him. I purposefully didn't give it to him in advance. And it was so I could go step by step through there. So that's number one. Never send the information because they're going to start making assumptions without you there. Number two is book the next appointment or next call from this one. Get it on the calendar. And I mean scheduled with the invitation, their emails in it. It's blocked off. And that way you've got at least a better chance 
of them showing up. You're not going to get surprised of, oh, I, I forgot you were going to call Jeremy. Oh my goodness. You know, like I'll call you next week. Next week is where sales go to die. Don't do the I'll call you next week thing. Okay, get it scheduled in the calendar right in the spot. And number three, and this is the most powerful of all the points. At the end of the call, let them know that it's okay to have questions. And the script that I use is, David, look, it's been a pleasure talking to you. As soon as we get off the phone, you're going to come up with some questions, and that's okay. I want you to take out a piece of paper and a pen or an app on your phone, and I want you to write them down. And we're going to go through every single one of them tomorrow at two for our follow-up conversation. Oh, and David, you might talk to a business partner or a colleague or some trusted friends. They're going to have questions that you're not going to be able to answer. That's okay, too. Write those down, and I'll make sure those get answered as well. So... Those are the three pieces. And one thing I'll add actually to the second one about booking it. This is the most uncomfortable part. If at all possible, book your follow-up within 48 hours. People say, oh, it's a good time next week or I got to check on this, that, or the other thing. Nothing's going to change for the most part. So if I have a conversation with you today and we have a conversation to follow up 24 or 48 hours from now, I don't need to remind you what we were talking about. I don't need to remind you what was so great about it. It just keeps the conversation going. The momentum hasn't stopped. But if you give somebody a week and you don't pre-frame it so that they can have their questions answered when you get back on the call, those questions they have turn to doubt. The doubt turns to even more questions and almost guilt or fear. Like, oh, Jeremy didn't tell me that, you know, the program would give me a discount if I paid for a year up front. What else doesn't he tell me? Oh my, and then that's obviously a funny example, but there's some extreme things that people could come up with. Right. And, you know, they might feel embarrassed, like they've been, you know, worked over because of one thing that they think you didn't mention. Right. And so it's so easy for them on the next follow-up call that you said, I'll give you a call next week. They see your number. They just don't answer. They don't have to worry about you omitting any more information or being embarrassed because, you know, you push them emotionally to face a challenge that they were avoiding solving, you know? Yeah. So. Building that trust is so huge. So those are the big things. Don't send information. Get the next call on your calendar, ideally within 48 hours, and give them that script. Write down your questions, and we'll answer them at our scheduled call. And that so way, good. Next call, yeah, your next call becomes a solution, not yeah, a problem. A hundred percent. Really, really great. Well, as we're in the home stretch here, I'm going to ask mm-hmm. you three final questions. Right. One is about your sales superpower. One mm-hmm. is about your sales kryptonite. Mm-hmm. And then the final question is, how can people get connected and stay connected to more Jeremy brilliance? But let's start with the sales superpower. What would you say is, you know, put on the blue tights, jump into the phone booth, out comes super Jeremy. What is one of your sales superpowers that you're especially proud of or find yourself using regularly? So I think my greatest superpower is I've got the ability to put myself in somebody else's shoes, which happens to work well in relationships too. My wife really loves it. Yes. <laughs> but when it comes to sales, often we get onto a script, run a hundred miles an hour and the, you know, get them to say yes. And then eventually going to say yes to your offer and all these old school sales strategies that, you know, we've, a lot of us have learned for me, it's like, I get where someone's at and I'm really good at problem solving. So I guess it's kind of two of them, but when you combine them together, you can create the feeling, and it should be a real feeling, that you're just there to help them solve a problem. And I think it might have been Ted McGrath that said this. Sales is just solving somebody's problem that they didn't know they have yet. And so that's what it is. If somebody actually is in a conversation with you, your role is to help them identify that problem. And being able to do that from a sensitive perspective requires you to kind of put yourselves in their shoes. How do you push those boundaries of their comfort without being insulting? And it's hard to teach because it involves listening. It involves emotional intelligence and a combination that I only have probably because I spent my whole life just trying to impress adults when I was a kid. That was my my background. <laughs> I just wanted That's to- funny. Yeah. And then think- let's go to, to sales kryptonite, which is just something that no matter how professional you are, no matter how wonderful all of the strategies, it's this one thing or it's this one tactic or it's this one weak spot in the armor that just gets to you and you're working on fixing it, but what's the sales kryptonite in your world? So I hate negotiating anyway, to be honest. And sometimes I set myself up. So if a scenario starts with, forgive the language, but a bit of a sob story, I'm super soft hearted. And 
if you've ever read the book Influence by um, Robert Cialdini. Cialdini. Cialdini, yeah. He talks about this story where, I think this is in the book, where somebody talks about, like, when you give the reason why, people are more likely to say yes, no matter what it is. And I think the example is, let me jump ahead of you and line up for the photocopier. It doesn't even matter what you say after the word why. If you give a reason, they're more likely to do it. And I'm just realizing it now as I'm talking about it. If somebody gives me a reason why they should have some kind of discount, it just kills me. And there was someone that was in a mastermind with me. Oh, well, that's great. I mean, what's the pricing for people like me that are in the mastermind with you? Ugh. And it never ends well. Like I lose all those sales because if they're trying to negotiate on price, they don't see the real value anyway. So me working on it is me not trying to lose those sales, but I just don't budge. Now I just say the same investment because we want the same result, right? That's gold right there. That is the crowning piece of gold <laughs> from all the gems that you've dropped. Really, really great. Well, I know people are going to want to get connected and stay connected to more Jeremy. Let's talk about the website. Let's talk about the podcast. Let's talk about uh, the gifts, the links that we have for people. If you're listening, Directly under this episode in the show notes are going to be all the goodies linked up for you. Jeremy, where can we send people for more goodies from you? So let's start with the freebie first. So I've got this free resource. It's called the five C's of successful sales conversations. It's a cheat sheet. At one point I had it on one page. I just spread it out over three to make it look a little nicer, but it's one that my clients have used as a framework for the sales conversations to close five and six figure sales. So really easy to follow, but it shifts your thinking around that sales conversation. So your audience can pick that up at permissiontosell.com forward slash 5CS. Main website, permissiontosell.com. And you can check out what I do there. And where I'd love for people to go is to the podcast, which they can get to at salesteamrescue.com. I'm also some additional resources there as well. But that's where we have all the fun with awesome guests like David. Well, Jeremy DeMerchant, remember... Merchant means money. So literally, Jeremy DeMerchant, yes, his name means money. His name means commerce. His name means you will sell more, sell bigger, sell better, sell easier if you connect with Jeremy and all the fantastic resources that he has. So great to talk to you, my friend. I really appreciate you jumping on with us. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here, Dave. I appreciate it. Thanks. And that wraps up another episode of The Selling Show. Hey, tell you what, if you like us, rate us and review us on Apple Podcasts, subscribe, tell a friend, go grab the notes and downloads and extras at thesellingshow.com. See you next time.